my dear children namaste and welcome to session 1 of cbsc class 10 biology chapter 1 life processes for this academic year this is ambika your biology master teacher right here on this brand new channel vedantu 9 and 10 english hope all of you are doing absolutely great especially staying healthy and happy right uh, you know what i actually happened to uh, notice very recently yesterday or today that i'm this is how i'm starting most of my sessions these days hope you're starting you hope you're staying happy and staying healthy because probably because i am so concerned about everyone in that sense this is super duper important at this point of time so let's take all precautions and things will get back to normal very soon okay and with that let's get started as my regular children from last year would know i always like starting my sessions with a positive quote and this is what i have to tell you today believe in yourself and you will be unstoppable right i think i have been saying this in my motivational sessions also um, because it's very important your belief in yourself matters a lot more than what others think about you or others believes about you right all you need to do is understand your strengths and weaknesses have a clear goal in mind and then that's it you're on the right track you will be unstoppable nothing can stop you from achieving your dreams okay and before we get started with the content for life processes there are a few things i want to tell you um i completely understand that most of you especially in this academic year because your schools are also happening online you might be facing a lot of academic related uh, issues right because online schooling has become the new normal so perhaps we were thinking about what are the most common issues children face these days especially 9th and 10th graders like you all mostly you may have doubts you may not have proper notes because obviously because you are perhaps making your own notes now and there's nobody to uh, regularly check on how you are making your notes uh, and then proper tests and assignments systematically happening tests and assignments um, and then what about cases where you are preparing for some competitive exam that also can be a concern your choice of schedule or your choice of language all of these can be problems but you know what right here at vedantu we have got all your problems solved okay and in addition to this we also have a lot of bonus features for you and when i say bonus these are the major bonus features that i am talking about unlimited live classes and then you have access to all micro courses and crash courses and then you get performance reports and you get personalized attention from our very very sincere and passionate master teachers okay so these are a lot of the bonuses that you can get through subscription of a lot of our regular courses obviously you may ask me ma'am then why youtube well youtube is just here to give you a support ensure that everyone has access to good quality good quality education right but then apart from this there is a limit to what we can do on youtube of course as much as possible we are trying to um, keep the sessions engaging we are trying to cover the syllabus as much as possible but then it's not just that right there is a lot more that goes into um, holistic learning of your entire syllabus that is how we started talking about we found the importance of talking about all these courses to you um, for you to know more details i have put this here for you the link here for you just visit vdnt.in/ytpro okay just make a note of that visit that you will get the complete details of all that i was talking about and now most children when i talk about these the first question i uh, encounter is ma'am what is the pricing like of all these courses okay so for you to get an idea we are keeping that also transparent here for your pro subscription courses for cbsc class 10 academic year 2020 21 this is it we have a one month plan we have three months plan we have six months plan see what works for you what is pocket friendly for you and includes all your preferred features together and then decide for yourself what to do okay so um, this is what the pricing is like the normal pricing is usually 2699 for a one month pro subscription but then if you can apply the code ambpro okay by applying the coupon ambpro you get a discount and the discounted price is 
2,294.15 getting reduced to 2,294.15 this is for one month subscription and for three month subscription the normal price is 6,999 whereas after applying the code the coupon code AMBPRO you get the discounted price of 5,949.15 again I repeat this is for three months okay and for six months again we have another option for you um, the normal price payable would be 11,499 but then again using the same coupon code which let me remember you remind you AMBPRO okay AMBPRO as you can see here uh, you get a discounted price of 9,774.15 okay and that's about it this is about the pro subscription courses do not forget children please do visit the link um, that i told you just click on the link and read through all the details you will understand a to z of what pro subscription courses are like okay and then decide for yourself do not give up on this valuable chance with that there we go let us get started in today's session what are we going to try to understand? What are life processes? What are the types of nutrition? And about the human digestive system. Okay. So um, I think, oh, I just realized, by the way, that uh, I think on YouTube, this is the very first time I'm teaching CBSE children. So a big hi to all those children out there who are attending my sessions for the very first time. Uh, and rest of you, welcome back to my sessions and let us have fun and make all your concepts very very simple okay all right now what are life processes exactly what do i mean when i mention the term life processes which is the name of your chapter basically life processes as you can see at the bottom there that i have put life processes are the basic functions performed by a living organism to maintain life okay what you can see there are also pictures of the most common life processes that we talk about in this chapter which is the digestive system your respiratory system your circulatory system and your excretory system okay many of you may ask me ma'am why are we not talking about the nervous system or the endocrine system or uh, even the reproductive system as part of life processes but there are two reasons for it uh, one reason is that by life processes in this definition of life processes, in our context, we mean those processes, those biological processes, which are absolutely essential to maintain the life of an individual organism. Okay, so of an individual organism, I repeat that, that is very important to understand. I'm not talking about the human species as such. So I think this explains why we are not talking about reproductive system because an individual human being or an individual animal or a plant can live on its life without even reproducing right even among humans there are also couples who decide not to have children or do not have children for some or the other reason but they just continue to go on with their lives which means we are not considering reproduction as part of the life processes in this context okay so i hope that is clear and secondly the second reason um, is you might wonder why nervous system and endocrine system are not mentioned here well in my honest opinion ideally they are also life processes which are essential for the survival of an individual organism but we have put them under a separate chapter control and coordination for the simple reason that one single chapter cannot have so much of content i mean it was not our decision obviously you know that's how ncrt has designed it ncrt perhaps probably had in mind that control and coordination which talks about your nervous system and endocrine system is a big enough tap, a big enough topic to be a separate chapter by itself whereas here we can talk about more related processes like the four that i have mentioned here okay and in today's session we are going to be talking only about nutrition and digestion okay so i hope that definition about life processes is clear in your mind now once again life processes are the basic functions performed by a living organism an individual living organism to maintain life okay as simple as that 
and now do remember they are not independent processes although we are mentioning four different processes remember all of these life processes are interconnected okay um, and perhaps at the end of our last se uh, session of this chapter we will come back to the same slide and i will i would love to hear from you about how you think these are now interconnected for now just have it in your mind that they are definitely interconnected they are not standalone processes and let's get started with nutrition and digestion you know and you've been hearing from your lower grades the types of nutrition can be broadly categorized as autotrophic and heterotrophic so what are auto what is autotrophic nutrition auto you know it's automatic it's something that uh, happens by itself what do i mean by that auto Trophic nutrition means that an organism is capable of producing its own food just like green plants the picture that you can see there uh, just like the green plants and some bacteria a few organisms are autotrophic right whereas a few other organisms are heterotrophic including us including all animals cows um, goats sheep and even the carnivores tigers uh, lions leopards all of them and us human beings and many many other organisms even fungi for that matter depend on other organisms for their food and that is why we are described as heterotrophic okay because heteros means others and trophos is nutrition okay so heterotrophic example anything even we are examples for heterotrophic nutrition autotrophic green plants are the best example and now coming back to heterotrophic nutrition and its categorization there are three major categories of heterotrophic nutrition as you can see saprophytic nutrition parasitic nutrition and holozoic nutrition okay so saprophytic is um, the type of heterotrophic nutrition wherein um, the organisms depend on dead and decaying organic matter for their nutrition okay best examples are fungi that's why we have put the image of a fungus there of a, a mushroom there which is a fungus okay so saprophytic dead and decaying organic matter parasitic we keep talking about parasites right there is a um, there are uh, there are people with uh, there are also people who are described as parasites because they just come and encroach other people's area so that's just an uh, adjective that's used in funny context but then in biology in reality what are parasites they are the meaning is pretty much the same which is why i told you that analogy parasites or parasitic organisms are those which live on or in another organism and derive its nutrition from the host organism for example uh, lice head lice uh, many school children and some adults also have a common problem of head lice right it's a parasite uh, even mosquito for that matter is a parasite it sucks on your blood uh, and that is basically its food right so these are all examples of parasitic nutrition and lastly the major type of uh, another major type of heterotrophic nutrition is holozoic nutrition holozoic just like us uh, human beings and a few other organisms um, wherein we just depend on holo is whole of the uh, of the food item that we are consuming okay we don't um, basically it's neither saprophytic nor parasitic we are basically consuming the whole food item that we are trying to eat up okay holozoic that's about it so th these are the major types of nutrition autotrophic heterotrophic and the three major types of heterotrophic nutrition okay and now let us go on to talk about another very very important process photosynthesis in my opinion photosynthesis is in fact um a process that is responsible for all life on the planet why is it so because it's through photosynthesis that green plants are able to tap solar energy just like you can see here green plants are able to tap solar energy and use chlorophyll that they have and convert it synthesize um, all that organic food molecules that they store as starch in the leaves right and they distribute it across the plant body 
this is photosynthesis and why did i say it is the base of life on earth because without green plants which are autotrophs our consumers including us and herbivores animals and all other carnivores cannot survive without a plants herbivores wouldn't survive without herbivores carnivores wouldn't survive right so uh, this is why photosynthesis is the base of all life on planet earth as you can see light energy is used from uh, sun and then carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is also taken up water is absorbed through the soil and all that magic happens inside the leaf inside the kitchen of the leaf okay all of that we will be coming to very soon and it synthesizes an organic molecule which we call glucose okay and that glucose is stored as starch in the plant body okay and now as a byproduct of photosynthesis what happens it also releases oxygen again enough reason for me to say that photosynthesis is the base of all life on this planet because without oxygen which is the respiratory gas for all of us the life supporting gas for most of us without plants we wouldn't have access to that right so release of oxygen is another by product of photosynthesis and now if you were to take a, a simple cross section of a leaf and observe it under a under the microscope this is what you would see it to be like basically it has a waxy coating which we call the cuticle and then apart from the cuticle yeah apart from the cuticle below that it's got certain layers which are called epidermis which is the outermost layer that you see here and then below the epidermis there is palisade mesophyll or mesophyll as we may call it uh, palisade mesophyll and spongy mesophyll you don't have to go into understanding the details of that at your level right now just to understand there is the cuticle to protect it a waxy coating followed by epidermis followed by mesophyll and below that this vein that you see here you understand what that is right in our body what do veins do vein is a type of blood vessel in the human body most of you would know that it is basically a um, conducting tube in our body similarly even in plants veins are comprised of the conducting system which are xylem and phloem if you have learned this in your class 9 chapter tissues you would remember this well enough all of that makes up the vein right transports water and food from one part of the plant to another okay and then there is the lower epidermis also that you can see right here okay and what do you see here another magic opening which we call stomata stomata are plural and stoma is singular okay these tiny apertures which are guarded by a pair of kidney shaped or bean shaped cells okay stoma once again is one opening stomata are many such openings okay so what do they do stomata are important to take in and give out gases okay especially for gas exchange in a plant stomata are very very important uh, and this is why we are also showing you the structure of stomata here open stomata and closed stomata open stomata as you can see the guard cells right i told you a pair of kidney shaped or bean shaped cells which we call the guard cells they when they are swollen up because of uh, intake of water from their neighboring cells they swell up they are very happy and they just open up like that right even when we are happy we like to open up that way right uh, likewise even in guard cells they are swollen up they open up and this stoma is said to be open okay and all these labelings are just there for your understanding children uh, there is nothing complex about it these are just parts of the cells just like any other plant cell you can find the chloroplast the cell wall vacuole nucleus and other cell organelles okay that's it and then for some reason or the other um, under certain conditions when the guard cells lose the water that they had in them they tend to shrink when the guard cells are shrunken the stomata are said to be closed okay so open stomata closed stomata what are the conditions for those i think this makes it very clear to you 
about the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata. There is a little more of a complex process associated with this, you, which you will learn in your uh, 11th standard. But for now, this is good enough for your understanding. Okay. And now let us also talk about nutrition in another um, very, very significant organism, which is neither a plant nor an animal. It's rather a protist. Okay. It is amoeba, a unicellular organism, a tiny organism um, that is also an example of holozoic nutrition. Okay, so as you can see, these are the steps of nutrition in amoeba. Um, let's just try to understand that this is the amoeba cell. As you know, it's, it's got no definite shape to its body. It's just a simple shapeless cell which just extends its pseudopodia according to which the shape is adjusted and according to it, it can move or feed on its food right so that is amoeba which is approaching its food particle the first image that you see here and then the next one that you see here is the amoeba cell extending its pseudopodia or false feet around the food okay imagine it uh, like a cartoony character in your head um, it's just coming near its food and as soon as it sees it it's like okay we shouldn't give up on this chance it's just spreading out its pseudopodia and trying to engulf it trying to cover it trying to capture it once it's captured the food particle what happens the food particle is inside the amoeba cell and inside digestion happens which you see here and then once food has got digested, what next? Just like us, even in the amoeba cell, absorption of the nutrients occurs. And absorption occurs after nutrients have been absorbed by all parts of the cell or all parts of the body, which is the cell itself in amoeba. The food gets assimilated, which means it utilizes the nutrients for various activities. Right? That is assimilation. And eventually... What happens is the undigested food particles or food material get ingested out and that is what we mean by ingestion. Okay, so once again, the names of the steps ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation, ingestion are in fact the five steps involved in holozoic nutrition. Okay, uh, so if you just think about it, in, a, in an organism as simple as amoeba, all these five steps happen and the same five steps happen in our case. Also, the only difference is because we are complex organisms, we are multicellular organisms, our bodies are a lot more organized um, in different means because we need that because we are bigger organisms. And the steps involved in, the sub-steps involved in each of these stages would be a lot more complex than amoeba, okay? And before we go ahead and understand more about how things happen in the human body, let us have a quick check. Okay, ready guys for the quiz? In case you have any doubts related to whatever I have taught so far, please feel free to drop it in the comment section. And um, we will be having a doubt session after every chapter. Usually that's uh, what happens. So as long as it's a genuine doubt and a, a very clear doubt that you have uh, put in, we will certainly be answering them okay so welcome to the quick check yes let's see who is answering first which of these is saprophytic mosquito amoeba plants mushroom quick my dear children and your time is up yes and the correct answer is mushroom saprophytic nutrition fungi i told you and mushroom is the only fungus in this group that becomes your answer question two which of these can carry out photosynthesis? Plant, fungi, animals, both A and B. Do you think fungi and plants can uh, carry out photosynthesis? Or do you think only one of these can carry out photosynthesis? And if so, which of them? Your time is up. And the correct answer is plant. Because obviously we have seen the structure in a plant um, which helps it photosynthesize. Right. Okay. Moving on. Chlorophyll enables dash to produce food from CO2 and sunlight. What do you think? Chlorophyll enables plants, insects, mammals or birds to produce food from carbon dioxide and sunlight. Super duper easy again. I'm sure all of you know the answer and your time is up. Obviously, the correct answer is plants. And another question I have for you. 
plants store carbohydrates in the form of glucose, fructose, chitin or starch. What do you think? Yes. And your time is up. The correct answer is starch. Perhaps most of you had a confusion between glucose and starch. So uh, where uh, that was possibly what I think fructose and chitin I don't think we have mentioned in today's session. So most likely I'm assuming you wouldn't have uh, Answer, put in your options as B or C. Glucose is the is the form in which plants synthesize food. Okay, whereas starch is the form in which plants store the food. Many chains of glucose, many molecules of glucose, and many chains of them together form the complex carbohydrate called starch. Okay, so that's about it and well done all of you who have got all the answers correctly rest of you just stay with me we have more interesting things coming up okay and that is about the human digestive system i'm sure all of you are fond of understanding more about the human digestive system um, or at least most of you would be interested in eating variety uh, kinds of food right and uh, i think on a lighter note, we can think about uh, think about all the different varieties of food that we have uh, in the Indian culture uh, across the cultures of different states. Karnataka has its own um, cuisine. Andhra Pradesh and Telangana states have their own types. Uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, northern parts of India have their own unique styles. Wow. Actually, it's after coming to Bangalore that I also started exploring so much of uh, varieties of cuisine. Um, anyway, it is also important to understand what would happen to your body when you tasted or when you uh, ate one of those interesting foods. Okay, so let us get started. I think in your lower classes, you have already learned that the major nutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, fats um, and all of those. I'm sure you are familiar with all of those terms. So they will also come in handy for your understanding of this section okay yes as you can see right here our digestive system okay is comprised of one long tube which is called the alimentary canal in casual language we call it the gut what is the alimentary canal why am i telling you this in the first place children listen to me very carefully many people okay adults and children alike when asked what the gut is or what the alimentary canal is, there is a misconception that alimentary canal refers only to certain parts of your digestive system, like only the intestine, either only the small intestine or only the large intestine or, or only the tubular parts of your digestive system or something like that. But no, that is a huge mistake that many of us have in our minds, a huge misconception Alimentary canal is one single long tube, the starting point of which is your buccal cavity or your mouth and its ending point is the anus. Okay, so starts at the buccal cavity and ends at the anus. That is your alimentary canal, um, colloquially called the gut. Okay, so as you can see in this picture here, children, the mouth or the buccal cavity has got what we call the salivary glands. It's got the tongue, it's got teeth, all of this to help break down food into simpler substances, right? And after that, where does it go? The food enters the esophagus. But in the middle of these two, you can also see a structure called the epiglottis. Why do you think this is important? Some of you might know this, some of you may not know this. Now, the epiglottis is basically a flap a cartilaginous flap which covers your windpipe okay your trachea or the windpipe because your alimentary canal and your respiratory system are closely connected by a common small part called the pharynx okay and in case you are just talking or laughing loudly and uh, you know with least attention to the food that you're eating Basically, I'm saying eating and laughing at the same time or eating and talking at the same time. If something like that happens, there are chances that the food, instead of entering your esophagus, it can get misled and enter into the trachea, trying to enter the lungs. Okay, it can go into the wrong track, right? That is why the epiglottis is there to prevent 
the entry of your food into the trachea while you eat normally okay but then if you're talking and eating or, and if you're laughing and eating the epiglottis might remain a little open which is when it may take a wrong path and that may result in you coughing out a lot basically that is an act that is a natural reflex by which your body is trying to expel out the extra food that by chance entered into the wrong tract okay that is about the epiglottis and then the esophagus take care of their spellings children spellings spellings i always emphasize on spellings in my classes um, esophagus can be e s o or you can also write it o e s o it's just a difference between british english and american english in india and in ncrt we usually follow o e s o p h a g u s okay esophagus or your food pipe which takes your food straight into what is called the stomach and inside the stomach a lot of churning and grinding happens and from the stomach it enters into the small intestine in the small intestine again a lot more churning happens and then also um, additional secretions from a few other vip organs also occurs and then the food enters into undigested food enters into the large intestine eventually fecal matter gets formed and gets gets removed through the anus the opening called the anus let us look at this one by one this is basically a gist of what happens in your digestive system okay starting with the oral cavity or the buccal cavity buccal cavity is nothing complex this is exactly what the buccal cavity is stand in front of a mirror open your mouth wide ah okay the cavity that you see inside your mouth is your oral cavity or the buccal cavity as you can see there are the teeth there is a muscular tongue and what you probably cannot see are your salivary glands which secrete saliva the uh, watery secretion which helps moisten and soften the food that you are trying to eat okay yes right here you can see the different types of salivary glands the parotid uh, salivary the salivary duct the tongue uh, teeth sublingual submandibular all of that is just there for your extra information you can just go through it uh, whenever you um find the time but for now just understand salivary ducts are there to lead your saliva and open them out into your mouth okay and what do you see at the bottom here what is this chain about imagine this g g g g g g like a string of beads okay a string of beads and each bead stands for g and g stands for glucose a chain of glucose i told you at the start chain of glucose a complex chain of glucose is what we call starch which is a complex carbohydrate there is a chemical enzyme in your saliva which is basically a chemical substance in your saliva called salivary amylase okay and that can break down starch into simple sugars that you can see either um imagine it like a two beads joined together a small string with two beads joined together um or eventually two or three beads okay it just i just i'm just trying to tell you that the the long string of beads is getting broken up into smaller or shorter strings uh, of beads and eventually at the end of digestion more such breaking will happen but this is what happens in your mouth in your mouth starch gets broken down into relatively simpler sugars which are shorter strings with two or three beads or two or three glucose molecules joined to each uh, other okay that is what happens in your oral or buccal cavity and then once your food has been churned well by your teeth and saliva and moistened and softened it gets converted into what we call the bolus and the bolus b o l u s okay bolus enters into the esophagus okay esophagus and through the esophagus inside the esophagus there is no digestion that happens it's just a tube which is there to lead your food from the mouth to the stomach okay and that is exactly what you see in this picture also and what happens in the stomach your stomach is basically made of many layers it's a strong sac that's there in your body which is made of multiple layers and there are something that we call gastric glands right you see this right gastric glands line the stomach okay all of these layers of the stomach that you see here 
have what is called the gastric glands. There are three major secretions for the gastric glands which are HCL, pepsin and mucus. HCL is nothing but hydrochloric acid. What does it do? It facilitates pepsin's action. Okay. Okay. If that's the case, what does pepsin do? Pepsin is very, very important for digesting proteins in your body. Okay. So, Pepsin, for pepsin to digest proteins, pepsin must get activated. Imagine pepsin like an inactive uh, character just lying there like a, um, like a very, very lazy chap. Um, proteins are there in your food which you are eating and then pepsin has to literally wake up to digest those proteins. But then who is there to wake up pepsin? Pepsin does not have the sense to um, know by itself that there is protein in the food that you eat. So what does HCL do? HCL creates an acidic environment and because of that acidic environment, this sleeping lazy little boy called pepsin wakes up and digests your proteins, begins to digest your proteins. That is why I said HCL is there to facilitate pepsin's action. It basically activates pepsin so that protein digestion can happen in your body. And then in addition to these two, your gastric glands also secrete what is called mucus. Just like mucus in any other part of your body, you're perhaps familiar mostly with the mucus in your nose or your respiratory tract. But there is also mucus in most other parts of your body, including your stomach. Why is mucus important? Basically to protect your stomach walls from the acidic action of HCL and in general protects the stomach lining. Okay, three major secretions for gastric glands. What are they? HCL, pepsin, mucus, each with their own functions. This is what happens in your stomach. And now the food is like, okay, my uh, carbohydrates is partly digested. Inside the mouth, salivary amylase digested carbo the starch partly. Inside the stomach, um, partly protein digestion happened. And now the food, the partially digested food has come into the part called the small intestine. What happens there? Now, a lot of things happen in your small intestine. Uh, I would say small intestine is perhaps your VIP of your entire elementary canal itself. So what happens is basically inside your small intestine, um, there are secretions that other organs also pour. What you can see here, the liver is the largest gland in your body. The liver pours out a secretion called the bile, what you see here, bile, okay, through its bile duct. Duct is basically a tube in biology, okay. So through the bile duct, liver pours its secretion called bile. What does bile do? Bile helps in emulsification of fats. What does that even mean? For those of you who don't understand the term emulsification, um, think about it like what soap does, right? You have eaten something very, very oily, chili chicken or gobi manchurian, chili, um, chili gobi or anything like that, chili paneer. Your hands are very, very oily. Uh, Provided I'm assuming you haven't used a fork or a spoon uh, as most of us Indians do because I think in my personal opinion eating with hands adds to a lot of taste. Okay, anyway, uh, all that apart, if you have eaten something very very oily and your hands are super oily, what do you do? Plain water washing will not get the trick done. To get your hands completely clean, you need the use of soap. Soap basically emulsifies all the oil that's stuck onto your skin. It breaks down the complex oily granules and uh, breaks them down so that your hands become super clean again. Similarly, bile secreted by your liver can emulsify the fats that are there in your food. Right? Which food? The partially digested food that's coming to the small intestine. Okay? So the bile basically emulsifies this, breaks down uh, does an overall breakdown of the fats that are there in your food. That's about the liver. What is this part that's called the gallbladder? You see this, right? This greenish part called the gallbladder. Yes, gallbladder is an extension of the liver wherein um, the bile gets temporarily stored. Liver produces bile and stores it in the gallbladder until bile is ready for secretion in the small intestine. That's it. Gallbladder stores the bile, liver produces the bile. Okay, and then the pancreas, another organ that you can see on the other side of the stomach, which secretes what we call the pancreatic juice. 
that is also a mixture of many different uh, major enzymes which are capable of digesting fats and uh, also proteins and partially also carbohydrates okay that is about pancreatic right so let us look at a little more about this this is basically about what happens in the small intestine for your information um, there is the liver which secretes bile but that emulsifies fats and then pancreas as i said secretes pancreatic juice which contains an enzyme called trypsin for protein digestion and lipase for fat digestion so you may have a question as a student i had this question when bile is there for fat digestion why is lipase even there that is a good question to ask but then what did i tell you bile doesn't completely digest your fat it only emulsifies the fat by which i mean it just breaks down complex fatty molecules into simpler ones but for fat to be completely digested into its minutest form it needs another enzyme which is lipase why is it called lipase fats in your body fats in your food are called lipids biochemically so lipase or lipase whatever helps you remember it easier use that particular term okay so lipase for fat digestion trypsin which di uh, which is rhyming with pepsin in the stomach remember pepsin was also associated with protein digestion trypsin is also associated with protein digestion right these two are the chief components of pancreatic juice and then the in addition to all this the small intestines walls themselves also secrete additional enzymes which we call intestine intestinal juice okay what does that intestinal juice do it does the final job of complete last of uh, uh, you know i would call it giving the food its final touch ups of final steps of digestion which is why it's written here final digestion finishing touches of digestion and ultimately when that happens you get your end products of digestion in the small intestine what are they carbohydrates the end products of carbohydrate digestion would be glucose glucose is the simplest carbohydrate right proteins when digested in your small intestine can become smaller beads again which are called amino acids the finest um, particles which together make up proteins so when digested proteins get broken down into amino acids what about fats i told you lipase is important lipase breaks down fats into fatty acids and glycerol remember this children this is very 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 important the end products of digestion where do you get them you get them in your small intestine okay and the job is not quite done yet what happens when the end products are done we we also mentioned large intestine we also spoke about the rectum the anus all of that what's with all that then already the final products are here okay we are not done yet in the small intestine itself once the final products are formed nutrient absorption has to happen how does that occur the lining of your small intestine is modified into tiny finger like projections that you can see here called the villi singular is villus which is why it's written villus here villi which are further divided into micro villi richly supplied with blood capillaries okay are super duper important and these villi and micro villi the blood capillaries in them directly absorb the nutrients which are formed by complete digestion in your small intestine this is where the circulatory system and your digestive system are getting linked right why is your blood there because one of your blood's jobs is to transport nutrients from one part of the body to another where are your nutrients formed in your small intestine from there your blood takes it and transports it to the different parts of your body okay as simple as that and now another question that popularly comes in exams is why is your small intestine divided into villi why are they finger like projections can't it just simply absorb it okay the simple answer is to increase the surface area exposed for absorption okay that is it nothing more nothing less okay so your body is designed in such a manner that it's designed for optimal functioning of all your life processes okay so this is about nutrient absorption in your small intestine now coming back to what you were what we started off the uh, the human digestive system with whatever it is that you may eat you may have um, 
started imagining with you eating your favorite food which could be either something very very desi i am very fond of indian desi food in general um or it could be pizza or burger or anything unfortunately let me warn you all so children minimal junk okay that is not going to help you grow in any way it's only going to add to obesity once in a while is okay but not as your regular meal okay simple homemade desi khana is always the best okay and you started off eating that your teeth uh, chewed your food and then uh, your tongue helped in making it into a bolus along with your uh, salivary secretion and then your bolus entered your food pipe or the esophagus the food came into your stomach your gastric glands poured in all the secretions and then that partially digested food entered your small intestine wherein you had the secretions from liver and pancreas and secretions of the small intestine itself to form the final products of digestion which are now absorbed by the villi of your small intestine to be carried away by blood stream oh that much happens you just eat your food and forget it but your body does so much of work for you okay and after this what does your large intestine do in the large intestine it is the undigested food material that enters all your digested digestion and products have already entered into the respective body parts through the blood stream your large intestine now is there to receive the undigested food if any okay so undigested food moves through the large intestine and in the large intestine no digestion occurs actually but then if there is any excess water that is there in your food the walls of your large intestine help in absorbing that okay and there are also some useful bacteria which are there in your large intestine which can also help in the digestion process in the absorption of certain vitamins okay that's just there for your additional information so as you can see excess water gets reabsorbed and fecal matter get formed feces or fecal matter get eliminated through the opening which we call the anus okay so then what is rectum rectum is also part of your large intestine it's just a temporary bag for uh, it it's just a bag for temporary storage of the fecal matter okay and that is it through the anus undigested food gets eliminated and now let me break another very 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 common misconception many children and many adults say food is excreted through the anus wrong again okay food is not excreted through the anus food is either ingested through your anus or food is eliminated through your anus uh, the undigested food okay why is it that we are not using the word excreted here excretion has only to do with your nitrogenous waste excretion it is your kidneys which are the primary excretory organs in your body and not not your intestines or the alimentary canal here it's very important not to use the word excreted or um, excrete or excretion only ingestion or elimination okay that's it do remember this uh, children this is very 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 important and it's a basic thing to understand for any biology student okay and now coming back to another overview children i think we are done with one round of overview uh, let's give our favorite food a form now maybe aloo paratha okay um, which is one of my favorite indian foods so you eat aloo paratha and in your mouth what happens you are advised to chew it properly so that digestion can happen better because your teeth tongue saliva all these three are working very hard to form the paratha that you put in your mouth into a soft bolus and that bolus is gliding down further through your esophagus which is a muscular tube and through it it enters your stomach okay inside your stomach your gastric glands uh, secreted certain digestive juices which were hcl pepsin and mucus most importantly each with their respective functions and again that partly digested food entered into your small intestine and what happens in your small intestine secretions from your liver which is bile secretions from your pancreas which is pancreatic juice and secretions of your small intestine itself which is intestinal juice all of these act inside your small intestine to finally form glucose from the paratha that you ate and the aloo stuffing inside it 
had a lot more vitamins and a lot more other nutrients the um, carbohydrates proteins and fats chiefly get broken down in your small intestine into glucose amino acids fatty acids and glycerol respectively they are the end products of digestion and they get absorbed by your small intestine the by the villi of your small intestine entering into the blood stream your blood stream carries it further to the different parts of your body and then there are probably some parts of your food which your small intestine your body couldn't digest what happens to that it doesn't stay there the undigested food material goes on and enters into the large intestine what happens there excess water gets gets absorbed from your undigested food fecal matter gets solidified and formed it gets stored in your rectum until it is ready for ejection or elimination from your body through the aperture or through the opening which is called the anus and that is about it okay as simple as that children this is very very important to understand at a personal level also because you must know what's happening in your body once you have eaten your favorite food as i said okay and with that let us go ahead and look at the next quiz let's see who's going to be doing best in this okay i will be watching this while the session is premiering so all of your answers right there all your attention on screen digestion in humans gets completed in the okay stomach small intestine large intestine rectum not more than 10 seconds for each question and your time is up the correct answer is small intestine no doubt about that bile is secreted by pancreas liver small intestine stomach okay and your time is up the answer is liver bile is secreted by the liver hcl secreted by the stomach what does it do protects the stomach lining digests protein helps activate pepsin helps with all of these okay and again your time is up yes there we go hcl secreted by the stomach helps activate pepsin remember it created that acidic uh, environment to wake up that slumber the the lazy little boy called pepsin from his slumber okay so that he could digest proteins now animals store carbohydrates in the form of glucose fructose glycogen starch and again your time is up the answer is glycogen um this is an extra piece of information for many of you it's not in the form of glucose it's in it's not in the form of fructose it's not in the form of starch maybe you thought it could be glucose or starch it's not glucose because glucose is the end product of digestion but your body doesn't store it in the same form just like plants uh, form glucose as the end product of their uh, photosynthesis but they store it in the form of a complex carbohydrate called starch likewise the excess glucose in your body which does not get utilized immediately gets stored by certain cells in your liver and muscles in the form of another complex carbohydrate which we call glycogen okay glycogen is a reserve form of carbohydrate in your body for your information now the chlorophyll of plants is packaged in a plastid called leucoplast xanthoplast chloroplast none of these let's see how many of you remember what i told you in the first half yes and your time is up the answer is chloroplast okay and well done again all of you who got the answers right the rest of you don't give up yet we will be coming back with another quiz we will be coming up with more quizzes hopefully we will be coming up with live sessions so that we can play quizzes on menti also which i know most of you are very very fond of so just stay tuned and wait for that and before we sign off quick recap you now know what life processes are types of nutrition okay and all about human digestive system and that's about it children before you sign off homework question all my sincere students from last year again on your toes uh, let's see who is giving me the answer first because as you all know whoever gives me the answer first i will be putting the screenshot of that answer with your name in my next session of class 10 um cbsc okay why does the hydrochloric acid in your stomach not damage your stomach walls i think i vaguely did mention when i was teaching this to you but do give it a thought do a little bit of research and tell me why this is a fact and 
Once more reminding you children of the pro subscription courses, visit vdnt.in slash ytpro and apply the coupon code AMBPRO to avail the amazing discounts which will be a limited period offer exclusively for all of you to make sense of and make it pocket friendly. Make the, um, the best courses out there pocket friendly to you all. AMBPRO. Okay, so do not forget that whatever your feedback is on this session children, please do drop it in the comment section below or send me an email at ambika.gopalakrishnan at vedantu.com. Take care of my spelling. I know it's a very long name um, and take care of the spelling uh, because it has to reach me, right? I always read emails. I reply whenever I get the time to. So do not feel bad or get frustrated in case you do not see an immediate reply from my end. Also, if you have any doubts, as I told you, drop it in the comment section below so that in our doubts session, which will be at the end of this chapter, we can take up those and discuss them as well so that everyone else can benefit from it. Right. Okay. And until we meet again, stay happy, stay healthy. This is Ambika signing off. Bye-bye.